Hello, I'm Carol Matriciana. Throughout this series, we've been looking at the changing faces of Eastern mysticism as it's been morphing over the last six decades from its more overt Eastern mystical religious roots to a more subtle repackaging presenting itself as science and a new spirituality. This revamping has attracted diverse audiences, surprisingly many of whom call themselves Christians but are not following biblical Christianity. In the 60s, India's religion mainly attracted hundreds of thousands in the flower power, love in, drug and peace hippie generation. In 1968, the Beatles, the British rock group, dubbed the world's greatest entertainers, who had a huge influence worldwide with their music, underwent a momentous religious conversion in Great Britain, led by Guru Godman Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, who in a brief encounter expanded their minds and spiritual consciousness to become dedicated followers of Eastern mysticism. Almost immediately, at a press conference, the Beatles claimed that their Eastern mystical experience had gone beyond what they'd experienced under drugs. They were instrumental in marketing Maharishi Mahesh Yogi's Hindu Vedic philosophy to their millions of fans who clung to their every word. The Beatles said, we want to learn the whole meditation thing properly so we can propagate it and sell the idea to everyone. And they did. They became Maharishi Mahesh Yogi's most vigilant promoters of Eastern meditation. On a UK nationwide appearance with Maharishi, John Lennon and George Harrison credited meditation with giving them more energy, recommended it for everyone, described their personal experiences and stressed an ecumenical, dogma-neutral approach to avoid conflict with established religions and practices. To increase interest and gain a greater audience, in a sophisticated marketing strategy, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi deliberately used the language of science to change the underlying Hindu Vedic philosophical meditation from spiritual regeneration movement to science of creative intelligence. In America in the 50s, the predominant traditional conservative thinking was based on biblical foundationalism in the idea that there was a creator God and he was outside of the universe and time and space and that through repentance and confession of Jesus Christ, eternal life was guaranteed. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish and have eternal life. The Eastern worldview offered another spirituality that God wasn't a person, it was a spiritual experience that connected you to your godhood and divinity within, that man wasn't a sinner, he was ignorant of the divinity and guru self within himself and that God was in everything and everything was God. The 60s and 70s saw the invasion of India's guru god men to the west and Indian thought was explaining itself as science. So its adherence changed from the counterculture to being more mainstream. In the 70s, Eastern mysticism was packaged more in psychological terms and the rise of the self-help movement saw dozens of motivational speakers, life coaches, teachers like Norman Vincent Peale who authored The Power of Positive Thinking. Psychology promotes the same idea as Eastern mysticism, that man is innately good and through regenerating the power within, better his own living. Faith in one's faith was the clarion cry. The emerging new spirituality was still using 
Eastern techniques like visualization, but legitimized the practices by changing the names to pseudoscience. In the 80s and 90s, Eastern mysticism had packaged itself as a mind-body science for the betterment of health and presented itself as the holistic healing movement, the recovery movement. These medicinal approaches to holistic health, the idea that all was one and within oneself was the guru power that could connect to supernatural power. A powerful tool was yoga, given credibility by business organization, government agencies, the military, and used in schools across the nation. Where Bible studies weren't allowed in school and biblical Christianity wasn't promoted in schools, yoga disciplines, mind-expanding, mind-altering techniques were being taught to children. In the 2000s, I actually had a sense that some kind of threshold had been crossed, that Alice Bailey's vision of a new world was actually coming into being in a full sense. And that was because there were various books that were just exploding in popularity. Uh, one in particular was called the, or is called The Secret, which actually says that you are God in human form, and you can project whatever you want and you can have it because you are God. You are the creator of your universe. And that book had sold a phenomenal amount of copies and the DVD was seen by millions of people and I could, I could clearly understand that the public which had been conditioned over the last to the 70s, 80s and 90s with this constant flow of self-help books based on metaphysics, um, what have you, that now the public was ripe and a, and a threshold had been crossed where now the New Age was going from a minority view to a majority view. Rhonda Byrne's book, The Secret, was a huge bestseller, also pushed by Oprah Winfrey. Uh, on page 164 of that book, the author states, you are God in a physical body. At the very beginning of that book is a saying from the Emerald Tablet, as above, so below, which means God is not only transcendent out there, he's imminent inside each and every person. As above, so below is a new age saying that I knew well from my days in the new age. It's the key to all magic and all mysteries, that we're all one because God's in everyone and everything. Over the last two decades, Eastern mysticism's greatest promotional tool has been the entertainment industry. In 1983, American actress Shirley MacLaine was a lone voice out there promoting the New Age. She introduced many in her book, Out on a Limb, to the Eastern religious beliefs of reincarnation, meditation, trance channeling through mediums, and more. Since then, hundreds of New Age promoters have saturated TV and the film world. Oprah Winfrey is just one of the influences who has given the New Age, new spirituality message to millions across the world. Oprah Winfrey has become one of the leading proponents of New Age occult meditation and Eastern mystical techniques, which she has disseminated across the world to her audience, to her audience of probably close to 47 to 49 million people. She has been referred to, not altogether facetiously, as the pastor of the biggest church in the world. And she has been a trusted and effective proselytizer and proponent of some of the most dangerous individuals and dangerous mystical techniques that we have seen, especially in modern times. She has invited probably every occultist and new ager and mystic and channeler onto her TV program and propelled them into stardom where anyone who has the good fortune of being liked by her and being on her program is guaranteed starhood. But who are these people? What are the philosophies and the teachings that are being propelled to starhood? One of the major catalysts for this mass acceptance of uh, this spirituality now is, uh, of course, Oprah Winfrey. She, uh, she was raised a Baptist, attended Baptist churches as she was growing up. 
but in the 1980s she read a book by a unity minister named Eric Butterworth who wrote a book called Discover the Power Within You. And that power, according to Eric Butterworth, is that man is God, man is divine. You know, this is classic Alice Bailey spirituality. And Oprah embraced this book and endorsed Eric Butterworth's message and became an, a, a major spokesperson for this type of uh, spiritual viewpoint. Eric Butterworth, the man that Oprah Winfrey credits with giving her a new definition of Jesus, she said Eric Butterworth taught her in his book, Discover the Power Within You, that Jesus didn't come to teach about his divinity, but about ours. You flip Butterworth's book over, endorsed by Norman Vincent Peale. Peale was Robert Schuller's mentor. Robert Schuller said he mentored Rick Warren. You go back to Norman Vincent Peale. He says that God is in you in the power of positive thinking. And then you look back and see that he was influenced by occult New Agers. We have a stream going from the occult to Peel to Schuler to Rick Warren to this merging church. And I would suggest that with the connections that Rick Warren has with all of these people, he is really the CEO of an apostate church. And there's Rick Warren on page 88 of The Purpose Driven Life, where he uses a new century version of the Bible that I hadn't heard of. And he said for Ephesians 4, 6, God rules everything, is everywhere, and is in everything. Ephesians uh, chapter 4, verse 6 says this, One God and one Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. This is one of the passages that people love to point to, they love to cite, and they say, See, this gives us this view of panentheism. God is in all things. God is in everything. The teaching of the nature of God all throughout Scripture is that He is omnipresent. He is everywhere all at one time. He is able to see everything and he's all powerful as well. That covers two of the three things that are mentioned here. The third one that he mentions that he is in you all, he's speaking to whom? The people there at Ephesus who were believers. Well, how does one become spiritually a believer? If we read earlier in chapter two, he talks about us as all at one point being dead as he's speaking to these people in Ephesus, and he's speaking to them as a common person with a common background. We all once were dead. And he says, but by grace, we have been saved. So there needs to be salvation. It needs to be spiritual. And it is a condition of God's grace by our faith in Jesus Christ that makes God in us. It is not innately a human thing. In fact, if anything, the Bible teaches us that we are alienated and separated from God by our sin. The only way that we become one or that he becomes in us is if there's been a spiritual rebirth that he addresses in John chapter 3 when he speaks with Nicodemus, telling him he needs to be born again. I am God. I am God. I am God. I am I God. God. I am God. A lot of Christians I sort of laugh when you talk about someone like Shirley MacLaine. She was the actress, of course, that first broke the New Age publicly. Uh, she had her books, one of which was made into a movie, uh, Out on a Limb. And she ran down the beach saying, I am God. And David Letterman and the rest of the late night talk show people made fun of her. And she had a very important role. She was willing to take the, the rap for being kind of like out there. But she broke that. And Oprah Winfrey, when she started introducing some of the stuff on her shows, people would just kind of like, oh, Oprah. And, you know, there, there's kind of a tittering. But people don't realize that Oprah Winfrey is perhaps the chief false prophet of our times. And she's so good because she's so believable. And the reason that she's believable is because she really probably believes this stuff, just like we did when we were in the New Age. If I had the platform that Oprah Winfrey has today when I was in the New Age, I would have taken it because I wanted to, to tell everybody about this idea that God is in everyone, Christ is in everyone. Of course, it was a wrong idea, but I didn't know it. The message that she has now promulgated and encouraged and promoted to her audience of between 47 and 49 million people. It was God and Jesus didn't come to earth to show you how divine they are, but to show you how divine you are. 
that divinity within, that separating Jesus the Messiah from the Christ, the anointing, and proposing that through these meditation techniques and these occult techniques of channeling and mystical uh, technologies that open you up to an experience of this divine, that all people could experience that inherent divinity which supposedly we are all born with. One of the books that is currently exploding in popularity now, I couldn't believe it, I was in an airport and everywhere I went uh, people were reading this book and that was A New Earth by Eckhart Tolle and in it he quotes many many Bible verses uh, but he quotes them completely out of context like he's, where Jesus says blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. He says that means blessed are those with higher consciousness. When she invited Eckhart Tolle on her program, a mystical New Ager who has written a number of books that are extremely well received and very famous. And he says that we are now going to come into a meditation and Oprah encourages him to lead her entire congregation, if you will, of 47 to 49 million people into this counterfeit of prayer, this communing with God, this mystical exercise that puts you in touch with what you may think is divine, but what is actually one of the fallen angels, demons disguised as angels of God. She did the world a horrendous disservice and has opened up countless millions to personal contact with demonic entities who are masquerading as their inner divinity. Eckhart Tolle is another one of the many authors. These are not isolated teachers. They all fit together and they form a composite. And it's the connect the dots that's superimposing a new paradigm, a paradigm shift, a new picture of who Christ is and who Jesus is. But in the new age, Christ and Jesus are separate. The Christ is in everyone and everything. And Jesus is just the one who recognized the Christ within himself and then shared that with humanity. In Eckhart Tolle's New Earth, he actually lays out a very utopian, positive view of, the, of uh, humanity's uh, future. And someone who thinks only in terms of the positive without understanding the doctrinal foundation behind things will see it as being of God. Oprah, during this time period, she has really launched a major, a four-pronged offensive to get all her um, listeners involved in, in metaphysics in this new religion, uh, people that aren't discerning actually will think that this is Christianity. So Eckhart Tolle ended up doing an internet presentation with Oprah Winfrey. His teachings are clearly all absolutely aligned with the New Age. The fact that he may use scripture or any of these other people use the scripture, you know, we use scripture in the New Age. Throughout the 90s, she had a series of um, metaphysical authors uh, uh, Marianne Williamson, uh, Deepak Chopra, Ilyana Van Zant, and very significantly in, in the late 90s, uh, a man named Gary Zukov. Gary Zukov uh, is, a, is a New Age leader who wrote a book called The Seat of the Soul and the Dancing Wooly Masters. Uh, he was on Oprah's program regularly as a uh, authority on spiritual things. Right after September 11, 2001, Gary Zukov showed up on the show as a matter of fact, many New Age leaders showed up on many shows on television after September 11 saying, our way hasn't worked, we need a new way. Well, spell that out. Traditional biblical Christianity hasn't worked, we need a new spirituality for a new age. They weren't, they, didn't, they never had our way. They never accepted it, but they make it look like they've been a part of something that didn't work. In fact, if you go to Gary Zukov's website, you can actually see and hear Oprah say that uh, The Seed of the Soul is one of the most significant books she's ever read. And in The Seed of the Soul, I mean, Alice Bailey could have written it. It's, it's Alice Bailey terminology all throughout. Um, and also, uh, Gary Zukov, he used to be on her show quite often, you know, practically, you know, like every, every few weeks or so. And in this book, he talks about your non-physical guides and teachers. And he says that, um, you need to turn your life over to them, that they're here to help you and direct you, and that uh, he says, take your hand off the steering wheel and let the universe take over, which is another 
term for new age term for God. But the fact that there's such an emphasis on non-physical guides and teachers, and you're supposed to say, you know, thy will be done to these beings. Gary Zukoff on that program after September 11th said, this is a good time in this crisis period for those of you who have inherited your faith to experiment and see if you really believe what you believe. It was, I, when I listened to that, it was like, it was like the serpent saying, hath God said, do you, do you really believe? I mean, look what's going on. I mean, maybe there's another way of doing it. Maybe we can all come together in another way. Well, Jesus warned in Matthew 7 that there is a way that is broad that leads to destruction. And I would suggest that the way of oneness, God in everyone and everything, Christ in everyone and everything, we're all one, is that very deception that leads to destruction and death. Another book that is tremendously popular, especially with women, uh, something like five million copies have been sold. Oprah calls it the woman's Bible. And Elizabeth Gilbert, the author, she says is everyone's guru is a book entitled Eat, Pray, Love. Uh, and in it, this woman uh, divorces her husband and goes to Italy and uh, samples the cuisine there, but then goes to India to Swami Muktananda's ashram, meditates, and has this blue light come down and possess her. And in the book, she says she was sitting in the palm of God's hand. Best-selling book about a woman who goes to India, and the, and the big line in the book is that God dwells in you as you. Julia Roberts stars in the movie. The Secret, Gary Zukov, Deepak Chopra, M. Scott Peck, I remember, was on her program. Person after person after book after book after book, just drilling it in. God's in you, God's in you, God's in you. You say something enough times, people believe it. A Course in Miracles was a work uh, that was channeled by an entity claiming to be Jesus through an uh, uh, atheist named Helen Shookman, I believe her name was. And in this, The Course in Miracles, uh, this entity claimed that uh, Christianity had completely gotten Jesus' message wrong about sin, redemption, salvation. Uh, Jesus was now saying that, well, this is supposed to correct, you know, this misinformation that Christians now believe. And basically you get a new age version of Jesus telling people that there is no sin, there is no redemption, you know, that they need to embrace their Christ consciousness, their Christ selves, and that is what Jesus' mission was all about. I studied A Course in Miracles that was channeled supposedly from Jesus, New Revelation, through a psychologist in New York City by the name of Helen Shookman, and she heard an inner voice that said, this is A Course in Miracles, please take notes. She did for seven years. A Course in Miracles was published in 1975. Gerald Jampolsky, psychiatrist, published his little book, Love is Letting Go of Fear, in 1979. Based on The Course in Miracles, it was given to me. I got involved with The Course in Miracles. What does The Course in Miracles Jesus teach? He teaches that the journey to the cross should be the last useless journey. I'm sorry, that's not what the Bible teaches, but I didn't know that when I was in the New Age, and I accepted that. The Jesus of A Course in Miracles, by the way, The Course in Miracles was taught on Oprah and Friends Radio for a whole year daily. Marianne Williamson was the teacher. Marianne Williamson is a, a woman who was made a New Age leader by Oprah Winfrey when Oprah Winfrey endorsed her book, A Return to Love, Reflections on the Principles of Course in Miracles. And Oprah says that this book is one of the best books that she's ever read. She bought a thousand copies and gave one to everyone in her audience. She said, if it sounds like I'm trying to hype this book, I am. And she said, the philosophy of A Course in Miracles could change the world. The Bible warns about seducing spirits like the ones that came right through in the name of Jesus through Helen Schuchman. And the Jesus of A Course in Miracles, the Jesus of a New Age, is not the Jesus Christ of the Bible. And I would suggest that the Jesus that is emerging in the church is not the same Jesus as the Jesus of the Bible. The channelers of today are having a greater impact on our society than we would ever have imagined back 10, 20 years ago. The channelers of today aren't only the Alice Baileys or uh, the mystics like Helena Petrovna Blavatsky who channeled the material that became Theosophy or Alice Bailey who channeled over 19 books through her spirit guide Joel Kuhl or David Spangler, who's channeled his New Age materials, a, a famous, well-known author and leader in the New Age Church, who is widely recognized and respected by emerging church leader, 
Leonard Sweet. The channeling is coming in ways that's very appealing to the youth through the psychic programs. There are dozens out there featuring channelers who are coming and giving personal messages of hope and encouragement to those who have lost loved ones. Sylvia Brown is one such modern channeler who is very popular on Montel Williams' show. Uh, there are dozens of them who have come through Hollywood giving words to the stars by which many of them rule their lives. But one way the channelers are functioning today is through channeling material that the spirits, whatever it is that's coming through, they are using these willing vehicles to write appealing and delightful books, reaching out to the society and reaching out in particular to children. J.K. Rowling, the British author of the seven-part series Harry Potter, introduced witchcraft in a child-friendly manner to millions of children worldwide. This childhood-friendly witchcraft was promoted in the classrooms across America where teachers read aloud Harry Potter in the classroom where biblical Christianity would never be promoted. A plethora of children's books, TV shows, films and games promote occult practices and are saturating the minds of young children to the dark arts of paganism, Eastern mysticism, Satanism, and more. J.K. Rowling, who wrote the unimaginably wildly successful and popular series of Harry Potter, talked about how the whole concept and the, the whole cast of characters and these beings came alive. It was almost as though she channeled them. Stephanie Myers, who wrote the also wildly popular Twilight series with these vampires who are coming and manifesting and the incredible allure they have for the young people today and for even people in the church who are writing whole study guides based on how wonderful it is that one of the characters of Stephanie Meyer's Twilight series, Edward, a vampire, is so concerned with protecting the purity of the heroine of the book, Bella until, of course, he turns her into a vampire by sucking her blood. And it was interesting for me to see that Stephanie Myers, a Mormon, who the Mormons are also well known for opening themselves up to spiritualist phenomena, phenomena that, that is used by the psychics in the channels to convey information, that she acknowledged that one night this vampire being whom she described as such a wonderful young man manifests to her and says what makes you think I don't drink human blood and she knew she had suddenly had an encounter with a living entity and realized that it was part of what was writing these books through her so this channeled information is being used to lure the society and especially young people into an openness and a willingness to participate in activities God has called demonic. Neil Donald Walsh, New Age leader, author of Conversations with God, said that if you don't go within, you go without. So I mean, it's a complete opposite. Why? Because this is the main way that the spirit world contacts us. This is how the teachings came through, through channelers, through psychics, through us and our meditations. You can't just shut off your mind. You, you, as a matter of fact, you can't even just recite scripture and then expect that what you're going to hear is from the Lord because some of the New Age teachers, Barbara Marks Hubbard for one, literally used the word contemplate and she used scripture. She did contemplative prayer. She said that when she recited the Lord's Prayer repeatedly, the Christ voice emerged within her. Like you hear practicing the presence. The question is the presence of what? Um, going within. What are you going within, you know, to feel or to see or to experience. If you look at the New York Times bestseller list, Eat, Pray, Love, The Secret, uh, Eckhart Tolle's A New Earth are all at the top of the bestseller list. Deepak Chopra's uh, The Third Jesus is, is up there. The, the bestseller lists are saturated with these books that, that echo Alice Bailey's uh, gospel of, of occultism, of theosophy. And this is what Alice Bailey's religion was all about, that we would all have the Christ consciousness, that Jesus was a model for higher consciousness rather than a savior. Deepak Chopra, in fact, he, uh, 
his new book more or less says it all, the third Jesus. Okay, the first Jesus was the historical Jesus who just, you know, existed in history. The second Jesus is the Christian Jesus who Christians worship. He's seen as Lord and Savior, died for the sins of the world. But the third Jesus is the uh, New Age Jesus, the metaphysical Jesus, who is someone who displays the Christ consciousness. Eckhart Tolle, Wayne Dyer, across the board, even in the contemplative prayer movement, Jesus is seen as, as Thomas Merton said, he's seen as a model for Christ consciousness, which we all can have. We can all be Christ and have the Christ consciousness. Thomas Merton, a Roman Catholic Trappist monk, who was a famed author and contemplative. He used these techniques that were brought in by the ancient desert fathers who adopted these techniques in the second and third century from the mystery religions in Alexandria, from the Buddhist brethren, from the Hindus. And they adopted the same uh, Gnostic heresies that much of the New Testament was written on, that we have an inherent spark of divinity within all of us. Whether the, you know Jesus Christ or not is irrelevant. We all have this spark of divine. And by using these techniques, we can experience our godhood. Eastern mysticism morphed into the new age, which morphed into the emerging new spirituality that has entered churches across the board. Rick Warren, one of the promoters of New Ageism, introduced three New Age doctors to his Saddleback congregation who promoted transcendental meditation, yoga, Eastern traditions, Buddhist meditation, Reiki Japanese healing, and other New Age holistic healing approaches. The church is confused about this explosion of occult influence in society because they do not understand the importance of going back to the Word as our foundation. It's not enough to have an experience. It's not enough to feel that something is right. If you are not testing your experience by the inerrant, infallible Word of God, you have no plumb line by which to measure or test or discern what is coming in. If I had known what the Word had to say, about mediums and occultism and divination, I would never have been involved. Continually being repackaged and revamped, this new emerging spirituality is even being promoted by the entertainment industry, who is influencing millions across the board with an anti-biblical worldview. Surprisingly, Christians are being taken in and deluded by the repackaging. Where Christians should be concerned and warning others of the new emerging Christianity, they themselves are being deluded with the repackaging of the new Eastern mystical emerging spirituality. God loathes syncretism. You cannot sanctify practices like these, bring them into the church and think you're going to honor God with them. God calls us to have faith in him in the finished work of his son, Jesus Christ. It is our trusting in that gospel, in that God, in the word that he has given us that brings that true relationship, not some experience dredged from the depths of occult mysticism, but a relationship with the living God through faith in his word that brings us into that relationship we yearn for. If Christians aren't serious about the Bible, they will seriously be deluded with the deception that is permeating our society. The Bible warns us that we must have a love of the Bible or we too will become prey to the delusion that's taking place.